At his Australian headquarters, General Douglas MacArthur weighed the factors involved in regaining the Philippines. Against nearly 3,000 Jap planes, he had barely 500. Against millions of Jap troops, he had 11 divisions of inadequately equipped Americans and Australians. Against him were time and space, power and preparation. Against him was an area which made even the United States seem small. Those men who were over Saipan in June and Guam in July were moving further west in September. During the summer of 1944, our Army and Air Forces had been cracking Japanese defenses throughout the Pacific, spreading destruction far and wide in preparation for the new strategic move to the Philippines. of fighting back to the Philippines required the closest teamwork of sea, land, and air forces. This brought General MacArthur and Admiral Chester Nimitz together for the planning of the campaign. The staging area for what was to be one of the decisive battles of history was Humboldt Bay near Hollandia in New Guinea. Under the escort of the 3rd and 7th fleets, Assault transports, assault cargo ships, landing craft, rocket ships, and over 400 assorted amphibious craft were loaded with supplies, equipment, food, and troops. The men of the 10th and 24th Corps of the 6th U.S. Army. An amphibious assault on what? Where? Which island? These men didn't know. They could only speculate. But wherever it was, they had a job to do. Here was the man who knew the objective. The man who also had a job to do and a score to settle. The armada of assault and combat vessels stretched across the vast Pacific horizon. Getting ready, waiting, resting, trying to relax. These men of the 6th Army still had that one question lurking in their minds. Where was the assault to be made? On which island of the Philippines? That's what they thought about or didn't think about, and prayed for courage to face. And the Lord said, be of good courage, fear not, nor be afraid. For the Lord thy God will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. The object was to confound and confuse the Japs, to land where they least expected us, and therefore where they wouldn't be as well prepared to offer resistance. Here's the spot our Joint Chiefs of Staff chose, an inconspicuous little island whose name most Americans had never heard, Leyte. Guns of the fleet opened up. The invasion of the Philippines was on. from 18 escort carriers blasted at the enemy installations, paving the way for our men. it takes. Your path before you won't be easy, but you all have the guts to carry on. 
Godspeed, God bless you. Americans all, some seasoned troops, some seeing action for the first time, but all knowing the job ahead was going to be tough. The impatient fidgeted. The religious said their prayers. It was the waiting and the wondering that made them taut and jumpy. The Japs were waiting too, dug in and ready for us. were against us. The enemy crouched safely in the protection of their shelters while we were bright targets outlined against the sky and sea. Moving in was one thing, staying there was another. The Japs were determined to drive us out because our presence constituted a threat to their dream of a world empire. We rushed our artillery into place and let them have it. Later, General MacArthur ordered the ground forces to secure the areas they held. He knew the Japs had decided to commit their fleet in the battle to prevent America's return to the Philippines. The troops ashore were to hold fast and await the outcome of the naval battle now impending. Admiral Nimitz radioed the Chief of Naval Operations in Washington that the Battle of the Philippines had begun in earnest. These bulldogs of the sea were ready to determine who was going to be boss of the Pacific. To be caught napping would have meant disaster, so our Navy was constantly on the alert. Already they suspected that the Japanese were setting a trap for them. pincer movement, the Japanese Navy intended to surround the narrow approaches to the American-held beaches, cutting MacArthur off from his supply lines and destroying U.S. naval support.
that was it. They planned to smash our foothold in Leyte at all costs. It would take us a year to regain it if the Japs could bring off their strategy. To make sure of thwarting their plan, our high command stationed submarines at the entrance of Leyte Gulf. The commanders of the submarines Darter and Dace discovered part of the Japanese Navy sneaking around the South China Sea. At once they radioed the news to our high command, then proceeded to fend off the approaching enemy vessels. The score wasn't bad. We sank two heavy cruisers and severely crippled a third. Then our good fortune ceased. In maneuvering for another attack, the darter struck a reef and had to be abandoned. Admirals Halsey and Kincaid met to make lightning plans to ward off the threatening pincers of the Jap Navy. Waiting to blast the southern prong of the Jap fleet were five old battleships. California, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Tennessee, all rebuilt and re-equipped, ready to pour forth their volley of revenge for Pearl Harbor. Long before dawn, the alarm called the men to their station. By 5 a.m., the old battleships of Pearl Harbor had the rising sun on the run and had repulsed the advances of the southern prong of the Jap Navy. But our troubles were far from over. While Admiral Kincaid's attack was shriveling the lower prong of the Jap pincers, the upper prong was pushing headlong into San Bernardino Strait, determined to destroy the shipping in Leyte Gulf. All that stood between the Japs and their objective was a group of low-speed U.S. destroyers. We had only a toehold in Leyte, but if the Japs could dislodge it, if they could seize the supplies we had landed, if they could decimate our troops and blast our ships out of the harbor, they knew it would take untold effort and time for us to replace all we would lose. It would be a catastrophe on the scale of Dunkirk or Bataan. Out to sea, the enemy was sighted. The powerful Japanese dreadnoughts were advancing relentlessly against our light carriers. Meantime, on shore, everybody sweated it out from GI to general. Our heaviest artillery was turned toward the sea. The firepower was formidable, but against naval broadsides, it was like pistols against cannons. Jap land-based fighters and bombers were a constant threat. Yeah. 
carriers radioed an SOS to Admiral Halsey's third fleet in the north. The Admiral faced a great dilemma. Should he go to the rescue and ignore the oncoming Jap fleet? Or should he hold his position and leave our small forces to fight overwhelming odds? He did neither. Instead, he kept the main units of his powerful fleet on its course and dispatched a carrier group to the Samar battle area. Facing the murderous barrage of the Japs' big guns, these little ships used every strategy to stay afloat. Some of our planes, unable to land on the flaming carriers, headed for Leyte. The unfinished airstrips were wet but not as wet as the ocean. Japanese suicide planes tore head-on to the carriers, the bellow wood in particular sustaining heavy casualties. they were greatly outnumbered, were never outfought. The heroic American spirit proved indomitable even against tremendous odds. We lost the Ho, the Johnson, the Samuel Roberts, and the Cambier Bay. We gained precious time with priceless American lives, time that probably saved the Southern fleet. Then suddenly, when disaster seemed imminent, the Japanese, for some mysterious reason, hauled away from the battered Americans. Probably the Nipponese admiral had heard of the destruction of the southern prong of the Jap pincers at Sirigao Strait and hastened to escape through San Bernardino Strait before he was annihilated by the victorious American forces in the south. On shore, the ground forces had made local gains, and an advanced GHQ moved into Takloban on the 25th of October, securing what was now the shambles of the town. Meanwhile, Admiral Halsey had decided on a daring and spectacular plan. He steamed north to meet the main portion of the Jap fleet, hoping to take them by surprise. This was the most powerful segment of the enemy forces. Supported by waves of bombers, it was assigned the task of mopping up the American Navy. The approaching encounter would decide Japan's future as a naval power. Undaunted, Admiral Halsey kept to his course, full speed ahead. As our fleet neared the enemy, the men rushed to their battle stations. blanketed the skies. But Jap planes were speeding toward them. Far below was the Jap fleet. Then the two opposing forces met.
When night fell on the last day of battle, it was apparent that the 3rd and 7th fleets had virtually eliminated Japan as a sea power. Thousands of Japs were fished out of the very waters they considered their own private sea, and our scouts were hunting down the remnants of the Imperial Japanese fleet. Now, with our naval supply lines secure, our ground forces were ready to fight their way across the island of Leyte. General MacArthur and his aides surveyed the situation from all angles, deciding on a pincer movement to trap the Japs. Construction and development of bases were initiated as soon as the necessary areas were secured. Toward the end of October, elements of the 10th Corps began to push along the Leyte side of San Juanico Strait. While this was going on in the north, the 24th Corps continued its drive across the southern half of Leyte toward Bai Bai. In an attempt to stop our advances, General Yamashita siphoned more troops onto the west coast of Leyte from the garrisons of all neighboring islands. Jap reinforcements poured into Leyte. But we were ready for them. We answered with everything we had, with steel, with fire, with determination. As November wore on, supply became a major problem, so both troops and equipment were landed by small boats. By a series of amphibious operations, American troops leapfrogged along the western and northern coasts of Leyte. By the end of November, the 10th Corps was surrounding Limon at the northern end of the valley road leading to Ormoc, the principal Japanese installation on the island. Our giant pincers closed in as columns of the 24th Corps converged on Ormoc from the south and west. for Ormoc lasted four days, and on December 10th, this last Jap stronghold on Leyte fell to our troops. By Christmas, all organized Japanese resistance was ended, and on the next day, Leyte was declared secure. This was the enemy we fought, an enemy in whom was concentrated the worst of human crimes. For years, the Japanese militarists drugged with the narcotic of invincibility, dreamed of a world empire. Some will never waken from this dream. Americans paid dearly with their lives, but not without purpose, for had our forces failed, the war would have been prolonged indefinitely. This was the final tribute paid an American pilot by his buddies. It is our duty to remember him and all the others who died because they have endowed our flag with new glory, new dignity, and new honor. They have committed liberty into our keeping. We must keep it glowing so that those who tread in darkness may see the light. Our liberty is no longer just a gift from our forefathers, but a challenge only by eternal vigilance can we keep it.